Good morning. Um, before we begin, will someone open us in prayer, please? Um, and I can see you're unmuted, but I can't hear anything. I'm Okay, okay, sure. Okay, I'll just open us in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you, Lord, uh, that you are the God who um, seeks to reveal yourself to us. Uh, we pray that as we uh, gather today, Lord, that you would be the one teaching us, you would be the one empowering me to uh, speak, and um, that you will be the one empowering us to uh, receive, Lord, what you have uh, for us today. Uh, we pray your presence, your power in this time together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, I posted our assignments, uh, two final assignments um, on Google Classroom. Have you all had a chance to look at that? Not yet. Okay, I'll just quickly go over it because one of your assignments is due this Saturday. Uh, so we have a personal reflection paper. Uh, you're all able to hear me okay? Yes? Okay, okay thank you. Um, Okay, so uh, I posted two assignments on Google Classroom. Uh, there's a personal reflection paper, which is due um, this Saturday. I can see some people have handed it in. That's great. Um, so this paper, um, I've, I've just asked you uh, to look at your presentation on the revivalist. And I want to know what was your personal takeaway from that presentation? What did you learn uh, as you studied that revivalist's life and, um, and um, how they were used by God? What was your personal learning and how, what is some things you can apply to your own life? Um, I've asked a few questions just to help you know what you can include in your paper. So what impacted you uh, from their life? Uh, what did the Holy Spirit uh, highlight to you? Something that you want to take, uh, you felt is a personal takeaway for you. Uh, why did it impact you? Uh, what uh, What is some specific new revelation you received? Uh, how does it apply to your life at present? And what steps are you going to take to uh, apply what you've learned? So what uh, what are you going to do? That, like some practical things that you're going to do uh, based on what you've learned uh, through that time of study. And uh, the things I'm looking at is I want the, whatever you're writing to be original. So I don't want... Uh, something just copied uh, from an online source and pasted here. Um, I am looking for, so this is a written paper, so grammar and your um, writing should be uh, 
you know just looked at so um, you can write whatever you've written you can ask someone to look at it and correct any errors you've made uh, get feedback and uh, make corrections so the grammar is also important and uh, correct writing uh, submission on time answering the question asked uh, so that you've asked answered it thoroughly and then I've given you a word limit of 250 to 300 words. So it's a short paper, um, but it, um, yeah, it's an important paper because um, not, it's not meant to be purely an academic thing, whatever we're doing here, but we want to see it impacting us personally. And so um, that's why this paper is important. Um, now, if you have not done a presentation on a revivalist, then um, yeah, uh, so um, you can pick, an, uh, pick a revivalist and do a study, and you can share um, about that. But uh, Prabhu, since you've not done a presentation, uh, you won't be getting any marks for that one assignment. Um, so, uh, but for this one, you can just pick any revivalist and uh, do some study and then share your learning based on your study. So share uh, in your paper, you can mention which revivalist you've looked at. Um, and then your final paper. Uh, this is a, not a very complicated paper. So I've asked you to look at chapter eight textbook, which is the pursuit of revival, the cry for a visitation and move of God. Um, and I've asked you to summarize what that chapter talks about. So you can just take the main points and provide a summary, um, or just mention all the main points that are there in the chapter and uh, compare those points to another revival uh, that is mentioned in chapter five. Uh, so chapter five is what we're starting with today. And Chapter 5 looks a little more in detail at just a few revivals. Uh, so you can look at what Chapter 8 is talking about. So chapter 8 talks about what all happens in a revival. Uh, so compare that with one of these revival stories from Chapter 5. Uh, or if you want to still stick to the revival list that you presented, you can use that and compare it with what Chapter 8 talks about. Um, so here again, um, um check your grammar check uh, your spellings all of those things and then uh, submission on time and uh, answering the question thoroughly and accurately uh, so those are two assignments and then we have one quiz which i will post uh, probably the last two weeks of the semester um, so that quiz um, i'll give you all about two weeks to submit um, this final paper is due on 11th November. So I think it's about, um, you have, yeah, close to three weeks to work on the final paper. Um, does that sound OK? Any questions? Okay. Okay, sure. Let's go. Thank you. Uh, we'll go into our um, into chapter five. Uh, yes, the reflection paper is due on Saturday, this Saturday. So that's the 28th of October. Um, it's due, I think, uh, sometime midday. So if you can submit it by the morning, just to make sure you've turned it in on time, uh, that'll be good. OK, thank you. Um, I'll just share my screen.
um, nickel uh, October 28th, so that's this Saturday. Uh, the reflection paper is due this Saturday. Okay, so um, we'll go into chapter five. We're just going to be looking uh, in a little more detail at some of these, uh, some of the revivals that we already covered uh, when we were going through that whole timeline uh, of uh, church history. Uh, so the first revival we look at is uh, the Moravian revival, which we actually we did go into some detail when we were looking at it before, but we'll go over it and uh, see some of the key points uh, from that revival. Uh, so there was persecution in a place called Moravia, uh, where uh, a lot of Christians were present. And so uh, to escape uh, this persecution, uh, they moved to Germany and they were taken in uh, by Count Zinzendorf. So he was um, the son of uh, devout pietists uh, who were people who kind of went against the mainstream church of the, that day in Germany uh, because they uh, the pietists emphasized a personal faith and a personal walk with God, whereas mainstream church uh, was uh, much more just organized religion. Uh, so Zinzendorf uh, was the son of, uh, of a couple who were devout pietists, and he took in this uh, group of refugees um, and gave them a place to stay uh, when they moved from Moravia to Germany. And uh, this is how the Hernhut community was established. Um, now, the Hernhut community um, was made up of uh, 300 refugees, and they had come from different places. So there was a lot of um, there was a lot of infighting within the group because they all were uh, different culturally and all of that. So, uh, in May 1727. Uh, Count Zinzendorf uh, had a meeting and he uh, talked to them about having Christian unity and um, shared about Christianity, there being no Christianity without community. And during this time, they came as a community to repentance, uh, to repent of all the fighting that they uh, that had been happening between them, uh, and then to be restored to one another in unity. Um, after this, in August 1727, uh, they were meeting uh, with another church for a time of prayer, and uh, they were with the uh, Bertelsdorf uh, parish church and they had met with them and during this time of prayer uh, they were praying for uh, greater unity uh, they were praying for themselves as a church for their witness as a church uh, and during that time the holy spirit came uh, in power and um, they just felt uh, the presence of god in their midst in a powerful way uh, Count Zinzendorf talked about it as if he, he said it was like they were in heaven at that time. Um, so after this experience of the Holy Spirit's presence in their midst, this was the same group of people we talked about. They started uh, a rotational time of prayer. So they were praying 24 hours a day uh, in groups of two to three. There were 24 men, 24 women. And so uh, they would gather in two uh, groups of two or three. And uh, each uh, group would spend an hour in prayer each day. Uh, and uh, they started this and it continued for over a hundred years. Uh, so this. Uh, this prayer uh, really impacted the church powerfully. Uh, from here, there were uh, there were missionaries that were birthed uh, and sent out, and like we see here, all uh, 
uh, the number of missionaries that were sent out was more than all the Protestant churches uh, had sent out for the last 200 years. So this small group of people sent out more missionaries uh, than all the Protestant churches in 200 years. Uh, this is a map of all the uh, places to which uh, they went, the, their missionaries were sent. Um, so they had uh, 70 missionaries uh, that were sent from a group of less than 600 people. And uh, it led to the beginning of the Protestant world mission movement. Uh, and through this uh, Moravian church, uh, there were many other movements that were uh, impacted. So William Carey, who came to India, was impacted. Uh, by the Moravian Church. George Whitefield, who was part of the First Great Awakening. Uh, John Wesley, who, uh, who was the founder of the Methodist Church. Uh, all of them were influenced by the Moravian Revival. And a lot of uh, the prayer movements that started in the 18th century in America and in England uh, were influenced by this uh, by this church, by this prayer movement in the Moravian church. Uh, so some things for us to uh, take away from this revival. All in all, uh, there were about 226 missionaries that they sent uh, in just 35 years. They had sent uh, so many missionaries. Um, and uh, some things that we can learn from this revival is uh, the importance of unity. So we see uh, before the Holy Spirit came uh, to them in that meeting, they had already dealt with division in the church. And so they'd come to a place of unity. Uh, they were also meeting with another church during this time of prayer. Uh, and so unity is a very important uh, base before we see revival uh, beginning in uh, in a community. Uh, the second is responding to the Spirit. So uh, when the Holy Spirit came and moved in their midst, they responded by starting this uh, ongoing prayer uh, movement. Uh, they didn't just receive that presence and enjoy it and then continue their meetings as usual. Uh, they chose to do something about it. And that sparked further uh, moves of the Holy Spirit and uh, enabled them to take what God was doing there to other places, to other countries. Um, and then prayer as a very important foundation for the work that was done. Uh, so it was prayer that uh, that fueled the revival and the world missions. Uh, that they were that prayer didn't happen just at that point, but continued for a hundred years, and continued to raise men and women who would go out to other parts of the world. I'm just going to pause. And just um, have a, something bought in my throat. Uh, excuse me, please. Okay, so from there we uh, we're going to the next um, the next revival, which is uh, the second Great Awakening uh, of eighteen hundred. Uh, now this happened uh, in North America, and at this point um, there was a uh, a big drop in attendance in church in all of the different denominations that were present at the time and even in college campuses even though those college campuses were christian campuses uh, there were no uh, believers on campus so uh, this is an example harvard didn't have any believers among their students. Uh, Princeton had only two believers in the entire student body. So that was the state of Christianity. This uh, 
the uh, country had been so um, the, the Christianity was the foundation of the people who had uh, gone to to the United States, um, but they'd slowly forgotten their faith and they had just uh, it kind of had become something that was uh, not of great consequence. Uh, and at that time uh, was also um, a growth in atheism. There was a growth in um, importance given to thinking versus uh, versus faith. So uh, that everything everything should be proved uh, by logic or by science and uh, and so more and more people were starting to leave the church and were coming to this place of uh, disbelief in god uh, completely uh, so that was the state of the church and uh, in this at this time a baptist pastor named isaac bacchus uh, began to um, uh, began to recognize that there was a need for revival and he uh, himself uh, started uh, to uh, pray for uh, revival and to send out uh, to other pastors from other denominations um, just uh, an invitation to pray uh, for the churches in America. And so they started to meet together and they set aside the first uh, Monday of every month. They would meet together and they would pray. Uh, soon after that, Christians across the country started to form these uh, prayer groups and they would meet together uh, and pray. Uh, one day a month, they would. Uh, pray together and then every Saturday morning as well they would meet for prayer for half an hour and uh, so it was during this time of prayer uh, that they started to experience revival um, it started in uh, Kentucky um, in uh, in a county called Logan County and uh, and then spread to various other parts of uh, of the US as well. Uh, so this is where uh, one of the revival spots, the Red River Meeting House, uh, where they started to experience uh, God moving in power. Uh, there was a Presbyterian pastor, and he was uh, pastoring uh, three small congregations in Logan County. And he started to lead his congregation in prayers for revival every Saturday and Sunday morning. They would pray. And then on the third Saturday of every month, they would fast and pray for, uh, for God to move. Um, the congregations were very small. There were the largest congregation had just about 25 people. So it was small gatherings, but they were continuing to meet and seek God uh, and asking God to move uh, in their midst. So for four years, they continued doing this, and there was no uh, change that happened. But in June 1800, as they were having a four-day meeting at this Red River Church, uh, the Holy Spirit began to move in their midst. Many of them began to cry. Uh, many of them uh, broke down, uh, collapsed, uh, weeping, and many of them just felt uh, deep conviction of their sin, uh, assurance that God had forgiven them. And so uh, just uh, a lot of people coming to salvation uh, as the Holy Spirit was moving in their midst. Um, in the same, at the same time, in one of the other congregations that the, uh, the pastor was leading, uh, they started to experience uh, God moving in their midst as well. And people started to come from all over the place, like we see in so many of these revivals. Uh, people start coming from around uh, that location to experience what God is doing in their midst. And um, there were powerful manifestations. We'll read about uh, different ways in which they saw the Holy Spirit moving in their midst. Uh, and the, there were such large groups of people attending uh, that they had to start setting up camps uh, for people to move. So if you see in this picture here on the left, there are tents where uh, the people were staying. And 
so that they could stay there for days and they could just come out on the campgrounds and listen to the preachers uh, speak. Uh, so there were large, large groups and meeting for several days uh, in the outdoors um, because of because they were just wanting to see what God was doing. Uh, at the same time, in another part of the same state, Kentucky, uh, is where God started to move uh, in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. So there was a pastor, Barton Stone, and he was the pastor of Concord and Cane Ridge Presbyterian Churches in Kentucky. Um, he attended some of the revival meetings in this Red River Church. And then he took that back to his congregations uh, and started uh, meetings in Cane Ridge in August 1801. Um, so people soon started gathering and there were 25,000 people uh, who had gathered to see what God was doing uh, at these camp meetings that he conducted. Uh, there were signs, wonders, manifestations. So people would be slain in the spirit. There would be loud laughter, people running and shouting, some even barking like dogs, holding on to trees, repenting of their sins. Um, so it was things that were very unexpected, uh, not things that uh, the pastors were expecting, not ways in which they were expecting the Holy Spirit to move. Um, but even through that, they were able to see that people were coming to repentance, people were being impacted, um, their lives were being changed. And so they knew that it was a move of the Holy Spirit. Um, so just in three years in that time, uh, there were 10,000 people added to the Baptist church, 40,000 people added to the Methodist church uh, in just three years. And uh, even other denominations grew uh, in large numbers during this time. Um, so in this uh, second picture here on the left, uh, you see many groups, because there were so many people, 25,000 people gathered, uh, and there were actually uh, pastors from many different denominations who had come together in these meetings. So what they did was they formed little groups of preachers. And, uh, and so the crowds would gather in different groups, and in those different groups there would be uh, different preacher preaching. So there were many sermons happening simultaneously on the grounds because there was no way to preach to such a large crowd uh, at one time. Um, and uh, so we can see all of the different groups and preachers there with those groups. Uh, also on college campuses, um, many, uh, many students started to come to Christ. So like we were talking about, atheism was growing and this uh, focus on using your mind. Uh, and so there was less, uh, less people willing to come to faith. So uh, Jonathan Edwards' grandson uh, was actually a president at Yale University, and he had been preaching for seven years in the college campus uh, on the Christian faith. Uh, but until that time, it had had no effect on the students. Uh, in 1801, he preached uh, on infidelity. And during that time, about half of the body came to Christ. Uh, half that student body came to Christ. Uh, and similarly, in other college campuses as well, um, revival started to spread. And so... Um, there was a great increase in believers on campus, which was also a powerful move of God. Um, so we see uh, here a few things. Again, we see prayer uh, as an important part of the revival. Um, we see that uh, it was prayer that led to the re revival, right? So uh, people gathering to pray as a church, uh, gathering to pray, fasting and praying and asking uh, for the Lord to move. Um, and it was a consistent prayer. So taking even up to four years of them meeting and praying and asking God. Um, there were unusual manifestations. So that was, there was controversy about, is this really God 
moving, but because they could see lives changed and uh, repentance, they knew that it really was of God. And then a transformation of communities. So uh, Logan County, there were many criminals, but there was a transformation in that community and transformation on college campuses. Uh, that was another effect of the revival. Okay, um, so from there we move um, into the Lehman's Prayer Revival. Um, so the Lehman's Prayer Revival also we looked at before as um, it started in New York in 1857. Uh, it is one of the biggest and most widespread revival in American history and came at a time when there was um, also uh, economic uh, challenges that were happening in uh, in North America. So businesses were collapsing. People uh, in New York alone, there were about 30,000 people who were unemployed. Um, banking system in different parts of the US had collapsed. And so that had affected a lot of people. Uh, at the same time, there were preachers that God was raising up, so Charles Finney, uh, Walter and Phoebe Palmer, uh, who started to preach, and there was a deep hunger within people's hearts um, to see a revival. Uh, at this time, in 1840, uh, there's a church named the Park Street Church in Boston. Uh, that's where they, they started to pray for revival. Uh, and many churches and individuals across New York and Boston uh, started to pray. Uh, one specific individual is Jeremiah Lanfear, and he had uh, just been sent to New York uh, as a city missionary. And he, he, he uh, came up with this uh, plan to start, uh, start prayer meetings at noon. So uh, noon was when people would take a break uh, from their work and they take a, they have their lunch and they dressed. And so he thought during that time uh, he would start a prayer meeting and maybe people would attend it. And so he distributed uh, some pamphlets and uh, held the first meeting at uh, a Dutch Reformed church. And only six people attended that first meeting. But uh, the second week, there were 20 people. The third week, there were 40 people. Um, uh, and, uh, and by the fourth week, there were 100 people attending those meetings. Um, soon, there were up to 3,000 people coming for those prayers. And then it continued to grow further and further, 10,000 people uh, attending uh, meetings out of 800,000 people in the city, 10,000 people who were attending those uh, daily meetings for prayer. And then um, because those meetings were happening, um, it got published in the newspaper and that uh, spread it to across America. So uh, just from New York, with uh, people meeting, uh, so many people meeting in prayer, it started to spread to other parts of the US as they heard about it through the newspaper. Um, so it's estimated that in that time, just because of these gatherings of prayer, um, one million people were converted. Uh, and another one million church members were revived in just two years. Uh, and by 1858, uh, there were 50,000 conversions per week uh, of people coming to Christ without any preaching or any pastors leading anything. It was just these prayer meetings with lay people it was not uh it was not being led by any pastor it was just um regular people who were part of the church who were gathering and meeting and praying and through that so many people being converted um 
So some reflection on this. Um, so this is yeah Jeremiah Lanfio who started those meetings, and this is just a what the prayer meetings would look like. Um, so uh, some things we can take away from this is again prayer that went on for many years before revival uh, and that that move of God's spirit happened. Um, uh, there was a small spark that lit the fire, and that spark was just the idea of starting a noonday prayer. Uh, so just a simple uh, idea that uh, God used powerfully uh, to make such a huge impact across the nation. Um, it was just lay people who God used. So there was no pastor, no preacher, no uh, no important or well-known person that did this. Uh, but it was just uh, these common people because of their faithfulness to meet every day for prayer, to sacrifice that time of eating and rest to actually meet for prayer. Uh, God used that powerfully. Uh, newspapers, so newspapers being used as a way to uh, share the news with others and then other people across the United States started uh, started doing these prayer meetings where they were and so how God used the used media in this uh, revival and then global impact. So we see uh, that what God started here in New uh, in New York, spread to North America, and then uh, sp spread to the United States, and then from the United States uh, around the world, um, where uh, a season of revival broke out in other parts of the world from this uh, from this revival. Um, We'll move into the Welsh revival. I don't have that on the presentation, so I'll just stop sharing screen. Um, so the Welsh revival happened in 1904, uh, and uh, Evan Roberts uh, was uh, a key person in the Welsh revival. Um, so Wales was not, again, again, in a very bad spiritual state at this time. And uh, Christianity was not having a great influence on the community. Uh, there were many churches that were empty. People were not attending churches, uh, were not attending church at all. Um, and uh, but around 1897 uh, is when uh, prayer within Wales started to increase. Uh, and from 1902, prayer intensified within the church, and there were more prayer meetings happening. And in 1904 is when uh, the revival broke out. So how is it that all of this started, that the prayer, uh, that there was this desire to pray and uh, people started to seek revival? Sorry. <clears throat> 